Like I said earlier, it's good to see everybody this morning. Our visitors have come a long way to, to attend the wedding and took time out to be with us this morning. We appreciate that. <clears throat> I've got two options here this morning. I either breathe or deliver this message. One of the two. I'm having a little trouble breathing this morning, so y'all bear with me. Today's lesson is based on last week's lesson. And it's going to be followed next week by another lesson that was based on last week's lesson. Now, if you didn't like last week's lesson, you're probably not going to like this one, and you're probably not going to like next week's either. But that's neither here nor there. So here we go this morning. There's a story about the conscientious wife who tried very hard to please her ultra-critical husband. She failed daily to please this guy. And he seemed to be the most cantankerous at breakfast. <clears throat> if the eggs were scrambled, he'd want them fried. If, you know, if she fried the eggs, he'd want them scrambled. So one day, at a stroke of genius, she figured out what she was going to do. So she scrambled one egg, and she fried one egg, and she put them on a plate, put them in front of her husband, standing there anticipating that he would praise her in some small amount. But he didn't. He looked at the plate and he kind of snorted and he said, Woman, you scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you this morning is about criticism or what the Bible calls judging. You know, it's true that some criticism is helpful. And we call that constructive criticism. But truthfully, most criticism is not constructive, but it is destructive. And the truth is that there's not a one of us in this room who like criticism, whether it's constructive or destructive. Now, Aesop's fable, we've all read those things, if not now when we were a kid. There's one that tells about an old man and his son who were bringing a donkey into the market to be sold. And they were passing some people, and they heard one of the guys remark, look at that silly pair. They're walking when they could be riding. Well, that seemed like a sensible idea to the old man. So he said to the boy, he said, well, let's just ride. So they get on the donkey, and they're continuing on their way, and they passed another group that said, look at that lazy pair. They're breaking the back of that poor donkey, and when they get wherever they got to the market, they're not going to be able to sell it. Well, the old man got off, and he was walking, and the boy was riding. They passed another group, and it said, well, what a terrible thing, this old man walking, with this young boy riding. So what they did was they changed places. And then pretty soon they heard somebody whispering, well, what a terrible thing, this big strong man riding that donkey making that poor little old boy walk. Well, now the old boy and the old man and the boy, they pondered the situation and they finally come up with a solution. They carried on going where they, where they were going to the market, but they had the donkey on a pole between them. <laughs> Well, that was working out pretty good until they crossed the bridge and the donkey broke loose, fell off the bridge, and drowned. So now, what's the moral of Aesop's fable? Is you can't please everybody. And there's an alternative moral to that. That destructive criticism never helps. You know, we hear criticism all the time. People criticize their bosses, they criticize their, 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 uh, one another, and they criticize the country the government, the people that are running the government. Everybody remember George Burns and Gracie Allen? George Burns once said, too bad that all the people who know how to run the country are busy driving taxi cabs and cutting hair. <laughs> <coughs> but there was a minister, and he preached a sermon on spiritual gifts. And after that, he was met at the door by a lady who said, Pastor, I believe I have the gift of criticism. And he looked at her and he said, well, he said, you remember the person in Jesus' parable who had one talent? And do you remember what he did with it? And the woman said, yes. And he went out and buried it. So with a smile, the pastor looked at her and said, go thou, go thou and do likewise <laughs> with your talent of criticism. <clears throat> now, the believers in Rome, <clears throat> they were divided between 
special diets and special days. Some of the members thought that it was a sin to eat meat, so they ate nothing but vegetables. Some of the others thought it was a sin not to observe the Jewish holy days. But if each of those Christians had kept his conviction to himself, there would have been no problem. But what happened to them, they began to criticize each other and to judge one another because of their beliefs. So the one group was sure that the other group was not at all spiritual. So if you would please, stand, with, stand and turn with me to Romans chapter 14. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12 as our text this morning. It says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is his own master that he stands or he falls, and he will be upheld, and for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. No, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Father, we just thank you for our time here together this morning. And Father, we just thank you for your word that, Father, tells us how to live. And Father, we just thank you for Jesus Christ who died on the cross that we might have eternal life through faith and belief in him. And Father, as we go into this time now, Father, we just pray that you would be with us and that, uh, Father, that these words would be pleasing to your ear. And Father, these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 says, Judge not. In other words, criticize not, that you may not be judged, or that you may not be criticized. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, the New Living Translation translates these verses like this. Stop judging others, and you'll not be judged. For others will treat you as you treat them. Whatever measure you use in judging others, it will be used to measure how you are judged. DeWitt Talmadge was a famous preacher and reformer back in the late 1800s. In fact, he died in like 1902. But he said, without exception, the people who have the greatest number of faults are themselves the most merciless in their criticism of others. They spend their time looking for something lowly rather than something lofty. lofty excuse me. Now, there was a preacher who capitalized on this fact, and he devised an effective way of handling people who were critical of one another. He kept a special book and it was labeled complaints of members against one another. And when one of them would come to him complaining about somebody else, he would take this book and he'd say, okay, here's my complaint book. I'm gonna write down what you say and you sign it. And the next time I see this person, I'll take up the matter with him. Well, now that ledger, that open ledger, seeing that, and the critic's own realization of his faults always had a restraining effect, but they would say, well, I, you know, I just can't sign anything like that. Well, in 40 years, that book was opened over a thousand times and no entry was ever made in that book. That's right. That's pretty smart. Yep. That was pretty smart. Now, again, in Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5, these are the same verses we used last week. 
It says, And why beholdest thou the mote, or the speck of sawdust, in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam, or the plank, which is in thine own eye? And how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of the brother's eye. Now, just think about this illustration that Jesus gives us in these verses right here. You know, you're on a construction site, and you accidentally get a large piece of wood stuck in your eye. But instead of doing something about your problem, you could ignore it, and you go to tell your co-worker that he has a speck of sawdust in his eye. Now, that would be really foolish behavior, would it not? If in actuality, that'd be foolish behavior. What you, do, what you should do is take care of your problem, get the chunk of wood out of your eye, before you try to worry about correcting your co-worker's problem, that small piece of dust in his eye. And that's what we often do when we criticize other people. You know, we look at something in another person's life and, and we criticize them for it, while we're ignoring the worst sin in our own life, a much worse sin in our own life. Before we get too concerned about correcting other people, we need to correct ourselves. Now, at the turn of the century, there was a distinguished astronomer, and he was certain that there were uh, canals on the planet Mars. Now, he was really con he was really fixated on Mars, and his name was Sir Lowell Percival. And he was renowned at that time for his study about the solar system. When he heard in 1877 that an Italian astronomer, astronomer had seen straight and crisscrossing lines on the Martian surface, Lowell spent the rest of his years squinting into the, eye, to the eyepiece of a large telescope that he had out in Arizona, and he mapped the channels and, and the uh, canals on Mars. And he was convinced that the canals were proof of an intelligent life on Mars, maybe an older and more wiser race than was here on Earth. Now, his observations gained a lot of acceptance at the time because he was renowned in his profession. <coughs> because of that, nobody ever dared to question him. But we know now that things are a little bit different than what he perceived in 1877. You know, we've had space probes that have orbited Mars and, and uh, they've landed on its surface and the whole surface of Mars has been mapped and nobody has yet seen a canal or a channel on the surface of Mars. Now, why do you suppose that Lowell had seen all of these things, all of these canals and stuff on Mars? Well, there's two possibilities. One is that he so wanted to see them through his telescope that he saw them. But the other actuality is that we know that, it, that now that he suffered from a rare disease that made him see the own blood vessels in his eyes. Then the Martian canal that he saw was nothing but the bulging blood vessels in his own eyes. Hmm. So that's the reason today that that disease is known as Lowell's disease. But when Jesus warns us that in the same way that you judge others, that you're going to be judged, and he warns about seeing the speck of sawdust in another's eye while missing the plank in ours, could he have been referring to the spiritual equivalent of Lowell's disease, this Lowell's syndrome? In other words, over and over, you know, we, we try to, uh, me, over and over we see faults in other people because we don't want to believe anything better about it. And often we think that we have a first-hand view of all of their shortcomings when in actuality, in fact, our vision is distorted by our own disease or our own sin in our life. Now, verses 10 through 12 that we read today, and out of the King James Version, mine was out of the English Standard Version, but out of the King James Version, it reads like this. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For if we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess to God, so that every one of us shall have given account of himself. Now, 
We know what that says. But the living translation, the new living translation says, so why do you condemn another Christian? Why do you look down on another Christian? Remember, each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of Christ. And then the modern English version. Why then criticize your brother's actions? Why try to make him look small? We shall all be judged one day, not by each other's standards or even by our own standards, but the judgment of God. The New Testament in contemporary language says, eventually we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Now, Paul said, he asked the weak Christian, why are you judging your brother? Then he asked the strong Christian, why are you despising your brother? Now, both the strong and the weak have got to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and they're not going to judge each other. They're going to be judged by God. That's right. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, According to that, he has done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is that place where Christians will go and have their works judged by God. Now, it had, doesn't have, that doesn't have anything to do with our sins. Our sins have already been paid for. Jesus Christ paid for those sins on the cross. So our sins can't be held against us. But our actions will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, the Greek word for that is bima. If any of you heard Mr. Uh, David Jeremiah on Friday, he talked about the judgment seat of Christ and that the Greek word for it was bima. And it, the word means is, is uh, a place where the judges stood at the athletic events, at the athletic games. And they said, during the games, if they saw an athlete that did something wrong or violated the rules, then they would immediately disqualify. But also, at the end of the games, the judges were the ones that passed out the rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter, chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 says, According to the grace of God which is unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For every found, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, these verses gives us a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul compares the, our ministries, the things that we do here on earth, as Christians, with the building of a temple. And we've talked about this before, about two months ago. You know, if we build with cheap material, the fire's going to burn them up. But if we, if we build with precious, long-lasting material, our works are, our works are going to last. And if our works pass the test, then we're going to receive a reward. Now, if they're burned up, we literally lose that reward, but we're still going to be saved, yet so as by fire. You know, we personally are going to be safe because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if we do that, we're going to go to heaven. Okay? But we will be trialed by fire when we get there at the judgment seat of Christ. These verses gives us another picture of the judgment seat of Christ. We personally are going to be saved, yet so is by fire. But how does a Christian prepare for the judgment seat of Christ? He prepares by making Jesus Christ the Lord of his life and faithfully obeying him and his commandments. So instead of judging other Christians, we'd better judge our own lives 
and make sure that we're ready to meet Christ at the judgment seat. Now, the fact that our sins have been bought and paid for and will never be held, to us, held against us again doesn't, is, is not a reason that we ought to be able to disobey God. You know, sin in our life keeps us from serving God as we should. And this means loss of reward if we don't serve him as we should. A good example of that is Lot. We all know the story of Lot. Lot was not walking with the Lord like his uncle Abraham. And as a result, he lost his testimony with everybody around him, even with his family. And when the judgment finally came, Lot was spared the fire and the brimstone, but everything that he had lived for was burned up. Yet Lot himself was saved, yet so as by fire. Now, Paul explained that they didn't have to give an account of anybody else but themselves. That they were to make sure that their account would be a good one. And he was stressing the principle of lordship. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Let him be the Lord in the lives of other people as well. So criticizing another person, whether it be another Christian or anybody that we come into contact with in our circle of friends, we're going to be called into account for that at the judgment seat of Christ. And we shouldn't be wasting our time by criticizing other people. You know, and if we turn on the light within our own heart and we examine that man in the mirror, we're going to find plenty to keep us humble before the Lord without being occupied with other people. We have enough to do but at the judgment seat of Christ answering for our own behavior without worrying about the actions of other people. So if you don't want to be judged, then don't judge other people. If you want heavenly reward, judge yourself. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 492 is our invitation this morning. If you need to ensure your rewards today, you come as we sing and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you come and join the church this morning, or if you need to just come to kneel at the altar and pray, you come this morning as we sing. Hold hands. We're going to close our service this morning, but God is so good. <clears throat>